Thank you for coming here. My name is Penny Wright, and I'd also like to introduce Tom Edmonds. He is the director of the Southampton History Museum. Most of you know who he is, but uh, that wonderful uh, museum is a co-sponsor in many of the activities we do here, and likewise at their venue. Um, we're really pleased to have a return visit from the mother and daughter duo here, <laughs> Velia and Eris. Um, they've spoken twice before, once here, once there. I think once it was about the Gilded Age life, and once it was about the colonial women. And what could be more fascinating than today's topic? So here we all are. And uh, just tell you a couple of things about Velia. They'll tell you a few things about themselves. But Velia lives her life by the adage, there is no growth without change. Uh, she's a teacher, an author, a former Brazilian dairy farm owner, <laughs> and an expert on New England's colonial women. Moving into a 1770 Connecticut farmhouse ignited her passion for the colonial era, era and led to her uh, entertaining uh, talk called The Not So Good Life of the Colonial Good Wife, which I think some of you heard, actually. So, Amelia and her daughter, Eris, present at venues throughout the Northeast and teach a variety of herbal and historical workshops. Uh, Who Eats What, Amelia's first book in a hands-on science series for children, was inspired by How Cool Is That, her hands-on science classes. Earlier this year, Vilya and Eris released their mother-daughter memoir, which is titled How to Survive a Brazilian Betrayal. And they brought copies today. They're for sale over there. I think they're $20. So anybody who wants to read about that sounds pretty interesting to me. Um, Vilya has two grown children, so that would be Eris plus another. And she has... Uh, She's the mother to many rescue dogs and cats. And she is also very interested in uh, alternative medicine. They, I think they both are. So we're delighted to have you both here. Please welcome uh, Belia and Eris. <laughs> Thank you. 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 So my name is Amelia. I'm an author. I'm a teacher. I call myself an expert on herstory, on sanitized. Um, this is my daughter, Eris. Hold on one second. Wait, wait, one sec. Okay. <clears throat> I was technical last minute stuff, you know. <clears throat> and I'm a green witch, herbalist, author, and holistic nutritionist. So people kind of know me as a colonial good wife because of my, of my pretty popular talk. And Eris owns Ground and Holistic Wellness. So two years ago, we joined forces, and we now call ourselves Grounded Good Wife, and we teach a bunch of hands-on Green Witch workshops, and what we call herstory unsanitized presentations, one of which is this one today, which is hot off the press. This is only the second time we've done it, so we're so happy that so many people came. So are we ready? So when we were, were researching this talk, my mom and I thought about the fact that my grandmother was born in 1926, just six years after women won the right to vote, and it just makes 1920 seem not that long ago at all. Right. So initially, we planned to be very, I should say, very ambitious, and we were going to make these cookies for all of our audiences. <laughs> <laughs> that idea went down the tubes pretty fast. So instead of the cookies, we decided we're, we're getting kind of popular for our quizzes. Since we're both teachers, we like quizzes. So we came up with a quiz. This is very informal. Just raise your hand or shout out the answer. Just kind of get the ball rolling. Just kind of thinking about the suffragette era and the topic of the talk. So our first one. So first one, on August 18th, blank, our 19th Amendment was ratified and American Union finally secured the right to vote. Good job. Ding, 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 ding. Good job. Very good. So question two. Saudi Arabia gave women the right to vote in 2015, leaving blank as the only place where women's suffrage is still denied today. Yes. Is it Iran? No, good guess. We, we, we feel a little bit guilty here because this is, this is kind of a trick question. The answer is Vatican City. That's because no one is allowed to vote there. But our point was we wouldn't get the point across that it's still very difficult for women to vote in places like Afghanistan, 
Pakistan, Uganda, Kenya, Qatar, Nigeria, Papua New Guinea, and Zanzibar. So legally they can, but as we know, they make it very difficult for them to do so. Third question. Blank was the first U.S. state to give women the right to vote. <coughs> wow, I couldn't even finish the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, sharp group. Women have been voting since 1869, and the territory that only agreed to join the union is the so, what there? was the state there? Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah, this smarty section over here, they got it before everything got the question out. <laughs> okay, next one. Blank became the first president whose mother was eligible to vote. FDR, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, or Herbert Hoover? FDR? Yeah, FDR, very good. Yes, because uh, Warren Harding's mother, Calvin Coolidge's mother, and uh, Herbert's mother had died before the women got the right to vote. And Sarah Delano Roosevelt lived to see her son win his third election in 1940. So, that was pretty good. Whose three colors did suffragettes use as a political symbol to support their cause? They encouraged women to show support by adopting these colors. White and White green. Green and gold. Purple and green. Yeah. Yes. Just so purple was for dignity, white was for purity, and green was for hope. So they have pin these ribbons or um, little buttons on their lapels or on their hats and sell all kinds of um, products like stuff like slippers and soap to raise money for coffee. And whoever said gold, someone over here said gold. I think gold in, in England, I think they were using gold. Oh, because I saw the slide before about the woman wearing green and gold. Oh, okay, oh, yeah, all right. Yeah, I think that was, that was more of an English thing. Okay, this is one of our favorite questions. Thank you. So the average American woman owns approximately blank pairs of underwear. Now you see what this talk's going to be about. And what do you think? How many pairs? 20. Who said 20? You're close. Tiny bit. Tiny bit. 22. Who said 22? Down like 21. 21. Very good. Very good. So you can figure out if you're kind of normal or abnormal. Or you can just wear the same, like, five pairs of underwear all the time. Underwear business is estimated to be worth over a million. More than a billion. Yeah. More than five billion. Wow. I know. Okay, Shomers. Thirty billion dollars. Yeah, thirty million dollars. Very good. So, by 1860s, it was common for corsets to be boned with as many as blank whale bones. Some corsets of the era had over blank bones in them. So what do those two numbers are? 60 is the first one, yeah, whoever said that, yep. And the second number? 100, yeah, very good, very good. You really are, yeah, you really are. So I think since you are such a smart group, you probably already know this, that obviously they were not whale bones, they were baleen. What baleen is, it's kind of like the stuff that looks like combs that hang down, hangs down from a whale's jaw, so you can kind of filter, you know, critters from the sea. Um, what happened was, at, at this point in history, whalers weren't going out anymore for whales for blubber because we had turned to kerosene, but they were going out only for the, for the baleen and then chucking the rest of the, the whale back into the ocean. So yeah, so it was very springy and tough, perfect, perfect for corsets. So yeah, whale bone, not it's, it's whale baleen, but everyone just says that. Next one's my favorite question. True or false, King Tut, who ruled from age nine to 18, was buried with 145 <laughs> pairs of underwear. <laughs> Yeah, that is true. Yes. <laughs> and he's coming back to Boston, I just saw, so yeah, so we're going to find out. Okay, the next one. Imprisoned suffragettes were forced fed by mouth, by rectum, and vaginally. That's true. Sadly, yeah, that one is true. We're talking a little more about that, but yes. Oh. This is my mom's favorite question. Yeah. True or false? Russians are experimenting with bacteria that will eat the worn underwear of astronauts on long sleeves. <laughs> it's so whacked out. It is. It is. Very good. And the last one, the whole reason we're here today is women wore corsets during times in history when their lives were severely restricted and they had few rights. As women gained more rights, they rejected the more restrictive underwear. Is that true or false? True. Right, exactly. Which is kind of our whole point of this talk today. Which is <laughs> suffragettes in corselets. Um, I think we didn't kind of warn you that this is a hands on presentation. So we're going to be calling up volunteers. I hope you're a nice, like, joining in volunteering group, because we're going to need some volunteers as this thing wears out, right? Yep. And, but it's, all, it's easy stuff. Yeah, nothing so, stressful. So, so just relax. Right. So we like this quote from Seneca, the Roman philosopher, who said, we live not according to reason, but according to fashion. So 
in the medieval era is a time when clothing first began to evolve into fashion and not just stuff that covered nakedness, like in the Stone Age or the Dark Age. <laughs> so medieval women wore something called a chemise or a ship, which is kind of like a long cotton nightgown as their clothing. And then um, they, over that, they wore something called a kirtle, which resembles very much what Eris is wearing right here. So with a kirtle, it was shapeless, but there were laces in there you kind of tie in order to make it look a little bit tighter. So buttons were considered, um, they were, buttons were used to adorn clothing because real buttons required holes, which would reveal flesh, which was a terrible, <laughs> horrible thing. Um, daring women, they wore something called a sideless surcoat. So that's the side of the circle there. The church called this Hell's Window <laughs> because the curve of a woman's waist could be seen. Now, Eris and I don't get this because Eris is wearing the kirtle without the side of the surcoat, and you can see, still, still see the curve of her waist. So why they're freaking out so much about this Hell's Window, we don't really get, but just kind of an interesting story. So very scandalous to wear that sort of thing. So the thickness and condition of a woman's hair was a sign of her fertility and had to be concealed from every man except her father or her husband. And actually, it was kind of practical to cover your hair all the time because it was pretty involved to wash um, so it could be up to three feet of hair and protect it from like the gross smells and open fires and stuff like that. So kept your hair kind of clean. So from, the 1500, from 500 to 1500 AD, women wore these things called wimples. Now, when I first shared this with Eris, Eris thought these women were nuns. They weren't nuns. All women wore wimples. And what it was, it was a piece of cloth that went under your chin, and you kind of tucked it in your hair there. And then there was a kerchief that went over the top of it all and kind of ran down the back. So it covered everything except the woman's face, including the ears, because it was believed that the Virgin Mary conceived Jesus through her ears, which I have never heard this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we did this read. Have you, what, what, what woman, uh, an art historian that we met knew this. Are you all familiar with this, or am I the only one? Okay. This is 500 to 1500 AD. I'm not a church person. This was like totally shocking to me. But so, so that's that's not a common knowledge fact, right? Okay, good. Yeah. So I have it on my notes. Eris is going to take off her kirtle gracefully. So let's go to the microphone. So <laughs> not very graceful. Not very good. So we're going to move on to the Tudor period, which covers the reigns of Henry VII, Henry VIII, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. And if you know your history, you know it was very important to keep your head during this, <laughs> during this time of history. So now Eris is going to put on something called a bum roll. So the bone roll was made to make your waist appear artificially small and the hips to make it look um, oversized, which meant that they were good for childbearing. Um, now, any time Eris and I see something that emphasizes that a woman is weak or talks about her as a sex object, we always say, blech. So when we discovered the reasons for the bone roll, we all said, blech. There's going to be a lot of blecking through this talk. So um, wearing a bone roll made it possible to relax. Eris, show them how to keep your hands. Yeah, because obviously if you were wearing a dress, you couldn't put your hands down, so you have to kind of keep them like that the whole time. Not super comfortable if you're doing that all day. And then of course it kind of pushed your boobs kind of forward, and it's very possible to sit her. Of course it's uh, kind of loose today, but very possible to sit down with the bum roll and the corset on. So now we're just going to take off the bum roll, right? And you're going to put on something called a farthingale. So hang on for a sec here. <coughs> So with the farthingale, there were two types, and they gave the cone effect or the tabletop effect. And obviously this one is the tabletop effect here. So it would show that you had big hips and a big bum, which meant that you were good for childbearing, to which we all say, well, yeah, very good. So it's alleged that Queen Joan of Portugal popularized the farthingale when she was trying to hide an illegitimate pregnancy. And of course, the court gossip surrounding this whole thing added to the popularity of it. And the farthingale really became very popular for quite a while. And for that one, Eris, it's like the possible. Yeah, you obviously can't put your hands down because that would look kind of stupid. Right. Uh, like that. Oh, She's wearing a farthingale, too. So there was the cone type, then there was the tabletop type, which is what Eris is on. But yeah. So moving on to Queen Elizabeth. So she believed that beauty was powerful and inspired devotion in other, others. And at the time, the church forbid makeup, but she was pretty determined to cover her smallpox scars. So 
So she started using white lead covered with an egg white glaze to help kind of make like a porcelain like shine on her face. And when we think of Elizabeth, we think of her looking like this. But I guess in real life she looked a little bit more like that. And in case you've never seen smallpox, which I have not, these pictures are kind of uh, yeah. so you can see what so damage that it would do. Right. So Elizabeth also used a chemical peel made from mercury, and mercury. Yeah. Yeah. vinegar, turpentine, oh, camphor, lemon juice, onions, and I think kind of like roses. Mercury is gross, doesn't equally gross. Distilled snails. Yes, right, yeah. So you're supposed to mix it into a paste and apply it to your neck, breast, to face, and then let it dry and leave it in place for eight days. Which we don't really get how you leave it there for eight days because you know when you put on a mask, it starts to kind of flake off after like half an hour. And also people would probably see you within those eight days. Very, those instructions are very explicit, eight days, yes. So by 1615, women had been using lead makeup for, for a century, and their faces were ravaged. So they started wearing full face masks, which they actually called visards, to cover up their scars. So some of these, they are just crazy. So some of them you kept on your face with a little kind of handle over here. Then there were other ones that you, you what, what you did was, they either had beads on a string, or there was an actual bead on the mask itself, and you actually bit onto the string and, or the beads, hold the thing onto your face. And supposedly, men prefer this version because if you had the bead in your mouth, you couldn't talk. To which we all say, bleh, very good. <laughs> Jeff. So now we're going to move on to, let me get your friend off. We're going to move on to the Regis era, a very, very short time in history. But the short course that we use at this time, kind of, kind of similar to the one Eris has on right now. And this allowed women's natural hip lines to show. So these corsets weren't made to flatten the boobs like that was the, was the, the case in the 1700s. And they also weren't made to um, squish you in like it would be in the Victorian era. But they were kind of meant to lift and separate. And the boobs are kind of, kind, of, kind of like a boob shelf. And the idea was to get your boobs as close to your chin as possible. So <laughs> there. And just as a little ha-ha, because that was interesting, that wealthy Regency people, apparently they enjoyed ice cream. And their two most popular flavors were rye bread and Parmesan cheese ice cream, which to me sounds absolutely revolting. <laughs> now at parties and social events, wealthy-ish women, if they had to go to the bathroom, obviously they didn't go outside to the outhouse, but what they would do, they would use something called a board loo. These things are actually gravy boats, because it's very, very hard to find a board loo today. So it wouldn't very much like the gravy boat, but just kind of more rounded there, and they're kind of anatomically designed for a woman's figure. So the name comes from Louis Bordeloo, who was a Jesuit priest, and apparently he was so fascinating that people thought that they couldn't miss any of his words and his sermons to go to the bathroom. So they put the Bordeloo under their dresses so they could sit through his holes. Oh, I'm supposed to move on closer to the screen. Okay, but very good. So moving on to the Victorian era, I always like to say that Victorian women wore, wore, wore more layers of clothes than a five-year-old on a snow day. It was the end. I never thought about this until I thought about this. But you know the Moulin Rouge and the Can Can dancers were so popular? I kind of always wondered, what is it, why? What's the big deal about that? And that's because at this point in history, up until World War I, underwear was still crotchless. So if you went to the Moulin Rouge, you really were getting a free show. Yeah. So what Eris and I love about doing our talks is we, we're popping up everywhere. And we were at Wilbraham Historical Society in Massachusetts. And afterwards, they took us over to their museum. And they actually showed us a pair of crotchless underwear, which to me was like getting a winning lottery ticket to see, one, see what it really, really looked like. So that's pretty fun. And people always ask, why was underwear crotchless? And the primary reason was because woolen clothing back then could weigh up to 40 pounds. So if you had to go to the bathroom and you had to lift up 40 pounds of fabric and pull down your underwear with the other hand, it was really pretty impossible to do. That's, so that's the primary reason why underwear was crotchless. So by the 1850s, skirts were getting wider and wider every year. It was pretty common to have up to 12 layers of petticoats under your dresses. Some of them would be stiffened with horse hair. So that's a lot going on there. Very, very horrible, yeah. So 1851, we saw the invention of bloomers by Mrs. Amelia Jenks Bloomer. She was editor of a New York Daily Women's Newspaper. <clears throat> they were a flopperoo because um, women in bloomers were accused of trying to uh, control their husbands and wearing the trousers in the family. So they were a flop. But the next thing in history was not a flop at all. Eris is going to put on a crinoline. So, <laughs> this is my favorite. Eris likes this one, yes. 
Well, not really. I mean, not to wear. I mean, not to wear, but okay. to wear it for a short time. So a crinoline was really, it was a set of light steel hoops. These aren't steel, of course. And women welcomed the lightness. As, as horrible as that looks, they welcomed the lightness compared to the 12 layers of petticoats. And all the classes took to wearing them, including some three-year-olds. I think you're supposed to come over here in the fingers. So at their height, women could be six feet wide at the height of the, you know, the crinolines. So two women couldn't go through a doorway at the same time. And I don't know why I find this funny, but I do. But that men, when they were squirting women on the streets, very often, it's not funny, but I find funny. Men used to fall into the street and get run over by carriages. So <laughs> it's not funny. I don't know why it's funny. I, find, I just find it. Funny. So one of the biggest producers of the crinoline was in New York City. They employed 800 women and they produce more than 8,000 crinolines every day. Wow. That's just one, wow. one factory, yeah. So to make the hoops required a ton of steel every day, and every month the factory would go through 150,000 yards of muslin, 100,000 yards, 100,000 feet of well home, 24,000 spools of cotton, 2,800,000 eyelets, 500,000 yards of tape, 225,000 yards of cord, and 10,000 yards of their yeah. So, death by crinoline was a very serious problem. We did a little video where Eris was kind of waltzing, <laughs> waltzing around in a crinoline and just walking back. You really don't realize how much fabric is back there behind you. So women very often got too close to a fireplace and they, they caught on fire. And sometimes they really didn't know the fire was going on. So in London alone in 1864, there were 2,500 deaths by fire. And we found this kind of facetious, this isn't real, a little facetious quotation. At all events, if crinoline must be the fashion, then every lady should wear a fire screen, or at least be attended by a maid with an extinguisher. Because really, it was, such a, it was such a dangerous problem. So there's also, this is kind of funny, there's also theft by crinoline. So one woman was arrested for having copious amounts of bed linen beneath her skirts, as well as a pair of steel fire irons suspended from her waist. So how she did this, I have no idea. There was also smuggling by crinoline, and one woman was caught with five pound cigars, nine pounds of tobacco, a quantity of tea, and a bottle of gin. So somehow she had that all there under the crinoline, which we find, we find very funny. And at the height of the crinoline, more than 60,000 yards of flattened steel wire were produced every day to keep up with the demand. And that's just to compare, that's 34 miles every day. So we're trying to impress upon you like how popular these things were. They were big. Now, remember we said this is going to be a hands-on presentation? Guess what? We need some volunteers. So we need either three or six volunteers. You're all looking at us like panic faces. So this is nothing bad. Just have a little fun up here. So we have any volunteers? You've got to tell people what they're going to have to do. Well, you're going to have to do a little waltzing. How's that? <laughs> but you don't have to know what you're doing. Yeah. You don't have to know what you're doing. You bet. I'll waltz. Okay. We have one. We need a three or six. Two. Two. One more person. We better be six. Three. Perfect. Yeah. Come on. Anybody else? Okay. Come so on. How do you do it? Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Yep. Eric, ready? Yeah. Okay, who thinks they possibly could waltz? Anybody good at this? Can you waltz? Okay. Eric, tell people how hard is it to waltz? I'm not good at dancing at all, so. Okay. All right. How about, can you be a very wealthy Victorian woman? Can you be a very wealthy Victorian guy? And can you be a maid? Okay, so, our wealthy Victorian woman, you're going to put on a crinoline. Okay. Our wealthy Victorian guy, you're going to put on a bow tie. Uh -huh. And our maid is going to put on a pink maid apron. Are they good sports? They are good sports. Uh, I think it's sort of like just close to anything. Yeah, I think so. I'm just trying to make tiny neck. Okay, it's good. Actually, it's actually gonna fall down. It's like, that's okay. That'll, that'll make it funnier, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's probably not unofficially, but. Okay. Who okay. gets the green? Hold on, let me guess. We're just tying up the maid here. All right, good. Hang on one second. Oh, no. <laughs> so, our wealthy woman and our wealthy gentleman, they're gonna do a little waltzing to the Blue Danube. Eris tried waltzing. Uh, it was kind of a very funny video that we made. So, ready? Wait till the music starts. Oh, this thing is. Yep, and then we're going to blow the whistle and you're going to stop. Okay. Yes. But I think this is going forward, right? Right. Is it starting? We have to do this really efficiently. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three. 
Oh, they're way better than you were, Eric. Yeah. You got the whole ballroom over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know how far back she, she, I mean, he has to stand? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's not, no, I mean, she's actually leaving. You really are, yeah. <laughs> Okay, ready? This so late. Okay, stop pulsing. Now, when do I go pop yet? So, it's been a long night. Your dance card has been filled. We've been drinking a lot of punch. A lot of punch. So your maid is going to come on over here with your Bordeaux. You're going to see. Yeah, well, you, you, you're running about off a little Halco, but I pointed to show how hard it was to use a Bordeaux when you were wearing the Kringlet. And don't forget, there would have been tons of fabric over this thing, too. So just to sort of, I think people don't think about this stuff. Okay, so wherever you guys want it. Very helpful. Okay, that was so much better. Okay, so we're on wrong, but. They would set, yeah, they wouldn't do it on the dance floor, but they would go into a little yeah. like back section, you know, maybe kind of sneak. Yeah. Yeah. I know, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you have two more opportunities to volunteer, so. Parasol. Okay. You know, when we started this talk, I thought, oh man, I'm going to go first stops, I'm going to find Grammy boats so easily. It was really hard to find Grammy boats nowadays. It really is. I've read stories that a lot of people have thought that they bought Grammy boats, but they really bought the Bordeaux because they really do look so similar. So that'd be kind of funny, wouldn't it? Actually, like people buy shaver pots and they really, I think they have Tureen, so. Okay, so now we're going to talk about corsets. So corsets were really worn all through history, but in the Victorian era is when that real extreme corseting stuff went into effect. So all women wore maids, I mean corsets, including maids. They were thought to be medically beneficial, and they helped support a woman's weak body, to which we all say, well, that's very good, that's very good. So the Victorian corsets enabled women to achieve the desired 17 to 22 inch waist. So I'm just going to show you what that is. That's 17 inches there, and imagine that being like oh, that's going to be a waist. Oh, I know. And oh, apparently, some women achieve a 12, 13, or 14 inch waist. And the rule of thumb, this one just blows my mind, the rule of thumb that a man should be able to go like this around your waist. So I would say, I'm going to pick, who, who cares what the guy looked like? I would have gone for the guy with the biggest hands. <laughs> but can you believe it? And this, this isn't like a joke, for real. This is how, how small they got their waist. So, let me go here. So, a tight-laced woman was a sign of good character, and a woman who didn't have her lace, her corset tightly, tightly laced up, was considered a loose woman, and that's the origin of that expression. And there were even maternity and nursing corsets. So, tight lacing, of course, made breathing difficult and led to fainting fits. So that was okay, because the fainting fits showed that a woman was weak and had to be supported and had a weak body. And we all say, Wait. <laughs> Very good. So tight corseting exerted 22 pounds of pressure on the internal organs. And we've been saying that for a while, but we've just sort of been saying it and not really thinking about it. So we have a little hands-on demonstration to show some brave person in the audience what 12, 22 pounds of pressure on the internal organs actually felt like. So we have a volunteer. You don't have to talk or anything. They don't talk at all. You just sort of have to groan. <laughs> Come on! Okay. Good, come on up. I didn't mention they have to get up on this table, but that's... <laughs> you really do. Well, okay, that's not too bad. That's not too high up here. What? Go on, just sit, and then we'll kind of swing your... You can kind of swing your legs up. I don't know about sitting on that table. I really don't. Oh, he's fine. He's good. You're good. Okay, go lie down. Anyway, whatever, whatever feels good for you. Could you be a good sport? Yes. yes. Very. You know we like kind of kooky things. So as I said, we kind of wondered, what does 22 pounds of pressure feel like on the internal organs? So Eris is holding up, or she's going to look for a second, a five-pound bag of potatoes. So we're going to put that on your stomach, and you're going to let the audience know how that feels. 
Okay. Do you think we're going to stop there? No. No. So, Eric said, number five pounds, which of course adds up to ten, ten pounds. Very good. Smart group. <laughs> okay. Next bag brings us up to fifteen pounds. How's it feeling? It's okay. Okay, fifteen. Then we have another five pound bag. We're at twenty. And then, of course, we're going to finalize it with a little mini bag with two pounds of potatoes. So that's twenty-two pounds of pressure on your organs. So imagine that all day, every day, and plus if you're doing all your daily tasks, does it feel pleasant? <laughs> she, she said, wouldn't she have a maid? Well, she would have a maid to like walk around and just, just like to eat breakfast. So is it unpleasant? A little? Okay. We did this last week and the person was like, <laughs> but all day, every day would be very unpleasant. So, applause. That's a pretty good one. Okay, good job. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, the sound effects make it all the way home there. You okay? See? You're pretty, those are <laughs> You can sit there, that's okay. She's good. She's a good sport. <laughs> Horses were, were worn during horseback riding, which of course was always side saddle. And lots of times people ask us why was it side saddle. That's because a woman had to remain a chaste virgin until her wedding night. And if you rode astride, your hymen might break and you would no longer be a virgin. How terrible that would be. So this is then, remember this is like in August, 40 pounds of fabric, side saddle, like very terrible. Um, the 19th century corset eventually evolved into something called the wasp waist corset. So responsible for organ failures and deformities, but a lot of people think it looked kind of cool, which is kind of open for debate. So men were told not to marry a woman with a wasp waist, because it indicated small and feeble vital organs, a delicate constitution, sickly offspring, and a short life. And a little warning to guys was, beware of them, unless you wish your heart broken by the early death of your wife and children. Because it looked because it looked good, because, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So the wasp waist corset did appear disappear in the 1890s and replaced by the S curve corset, which is just as damaging, just not as look as terrible. <laughs> so this forced your torso back kind of into a curve, and your boobs were kind of forced forward, and it kind of resulted in what they called the um, mono bosom or the beauty boob look that was very popular during the Edwardian era. So we found an autopsy in 1881 on a woman named Amelia Jury. So it revealed a stomach constricted to one eighth of its natural size, with a liver flattened and driven down deep into the pelvis. So obviously, of course, it's damaged. Then another one, an autopsy was carried out on a woman in 1895 who mysteriously died while getting a tooth pulled at the dentist's office. And they found that her liver was divided into two kind of separate things with only a thin little channel connecting them. So, of course, it's obviously really messed her up, too. Right. So the next thing Eric's going to put on, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, this is a bustle. So originally they didn't call it a bustle, they called it a shape improver. This, I think, Eric, wait, tell me your thoughts about the bustle. I think the bustle looks really stupid, so you can see what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Why I'll keep going. So, that's the bustle. So that was worn from 1870 to the start of World War I. And it was considered very aerodynamic and graceful. And women who wore a bustle, it was considered really, really, really sexy. A really, really sexy thing. Mm -hmm. There's something called a phantom bustle, where when you sat down, it's the steel wires kind of folded in on themselves. But so when you stood up, they kind of sprang back. <laughs> and apparently on Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, they invented this special bustle that when you sat down, played God save you. <laughs> and of course, we all know that women's clothing back then didn't have any pockets. They invented something called a handbag bustle, where there was some kind of large compartment where you could put brushes and a toothbrush and a nightgown. So if you're going down to sleep or something, you'd have all that stuff with you. Then there were two kind of cute stories. Apparently, two women wearing bustles were walking around on their farm, and they sat down on a log and they were gabbing for a while. Then I guess one of the women stood up and her bustle felt kind of heavy, and she discovered that there was a large copperhead snake oh, in there. Oh, ah. 
And that was kind of funny. A, a woman left her bustle in the attic for a while, and then apparently a, a mouse family made a hole in her bustle. So what she did was, she just kind of enlarged the hole so the mouse family could come and go. And I guess she was kind of eccentric, and at dinner, at dinner parties, she would just sit there and she would feed the mice in her, in her bustle. So I think she was kind of, you know, my kind of woman, she was kind of a little bit kooky. So I think it's, I think it's kind of a funny story. So what do you think about the bustle? Do you think it looks good or stupid? It's still there. I know. I know. I know, it's like some of them just says that one and the next one. I think that we think the two dopiest ones. So good. The next era is a very short Edwardian era from 1901 to 1910. So Eric's gonna put on something called a hobble skirt. We're gonna give you the whole story about hobble skirt in a second, but I'm just gonna put this thing on. Eris is kind of embarrassed to wear the hobble skirt because she thinks it looks very unflattering. <laughs> like the other stuff was too, too but <laughs> oh, this is her hobble skirt. Can you can you walk in the aisle a bit to show uh, sure, the camera? Sure. She's got a Morticia Adams in the aisle a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so this is the hobble skirt. Where do you want her to walk? I think we're getting around to her Yeah. So this was one last attempt at reining women in. And how this came to be is kind of a funny story. So some woman took an airplane ride with Wilbur Wright in 1908, and when she got in the plane, her skirts were all you know, all over the place. So she took a piece of rope and she tied it around her just to keep her skirts tucked in. Then apparently when she got out of the plane, people saw her and they were like, oh, what a great fashion. And that's how the hobble skirt was born. It was a total, total accident. So, along, so obviously you can take little tiny steps. So along with the hobble skirt, Women wore an elastic band tied around each knee, which was called a hobble garter, which kind of limited your movement so that you weren't ripping your hobble skirt as you were walking around. So, take a wild guess what we're going to do next. We need three volunteers to put on a hobble skirt. So who do we have up here? Oh, come on! You guys are so bad! You need one. Very good. Who else? Two. Thank you. Well, how about one more? One more person. Yeah? Great, very good. Okay, so Eric's going to hop you up over here. Is that right? And now I'm going to mention, I didn't let this part out. You're going to be participating in a little hobble skirt race around the room. So let's see how this goes. Oh, well, I'm actually though. Doesn't this one seem like the most ridiculous? Like, yeah. And the whole point was that you could not move. We'll tie you up either way, don't worry. No, we were here. Here, yeah. Here. Yeah, now, yes. Oh, tying you up wearing a cobble skirt and a corset. We talk about that later. Yeah, I think I think men in po we're going to talk about that's coming up. Yes, I think men impose these fashions on women. Yeah, of course they did it, but you didn't have a heck of a choice back then, I suppose. Okay, so we're going to get you tied up. Wow, tying someone wearing a hobble skirt and a corset. Yes. Okay. Right. okay, you're all tied up. Now, picture you also would have had a hobble garter, which we're not going to make you wear that. But all right, Eric, where's well, your you tying yourself up? That's impressive. That's pretty good. But isn't it funny that just because this was a fashion because the woman left the rope around her thing, like that would just a lot of them seem dopey, but that's this is the dopiest one of all. It is right, right. And of course, you were supposed to feel restricted, which is the whole point of the whole thing. <laughs> we're full for that. Okay, Eric, where's the root? Okay, so the root's going to be all around the whole. All right. And Eric is going to play a very popular song of the day, which was Alexander's Ragtime Band. So, we have to have an error so appropriate start. Here. The starting line is here. Okay. Ready? Where are we going? We're going to go around the chairs <laughs> and then go to my mom. Yeah. Okay. okay. Obviously, don't like fall down. Okay. Wait for the music. <laughs> oh, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. It was a tiny tighter. <laughs> good job. Our winner. Now, was it, now, also, you would have the garters on. It wasn't hard to walk. And I think actually it would have been even tighter. And it would have been tighter all the way down. So well, you walk from your knees. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. just obviously it's not. Strut. Right, yeah. yeah. Different strut. They look like a dance act, too. 
Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> That's it for hands on. I didn't have to do that. We're not done. No more hands on stuff. You can fail to move. Then you can decide to leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the 1910s. So fashion can be divided into two different periods, before the war and during the war. World War I, of course, we're talking about it. So when war broke out in 1914, it changed everything in the Western world. And one of the things that changed was that more practical and less restrictive clothing was necessary for women since they were doing the men's work, now that they were not around. Um, clothing lost its frills and trimmings and became more like men's wear. So of course it was out. And hemline rose above the ankle for the first time, even though a lot of women were like, oh, wore ankles to cover up their um, or ankles, wore boots to cover up their ankles. Right. So by 1915, skirts, skirts were as short as mid calf, and short skirts accumulated less dirt, which was important then because you know there didn't have very much help because the war was going on. And even society women were very simple dresses, since many of them were joined into um, the different armed forces and they were being nurses. So if you're a Downton Abbey fan, remember Cora and her daughters so all the hospital in the house. So we can we kind of read a little easier today, thanks to a woman named Mary Phelps Jacob. So women's lingerie was moving away from molding a woman's body to supporting it. So Mary Phelps Jacob, when she was a debutante, and apparently she was primping for some debutante ball in 1910, and she put on her corset. Then she put on her corset cover and was kind of poking through her sheer evening gown. So supposedly she told her maid, I would have asked my maid, but she told her maid, bring me two of my pocket handkerchiefs and some pink ribbon. So she created the first brassiere. So uh, the, the invention was the talk of the party and girls crowded around her. And it was such a popular thing that she invented the brassiere and the, the brassiere industry. And she gave half the money to her maid. No, no, she didn't. That's a total lie. <laughs> I would have done that. So the invention of the bra and the death of the corset resulted in 28,000 pounds of extra steel, which was enough to build two battleships. <laughs> yeah, so that's quite a bit. So for centuries, women have allowed themselves to be squeezed, twisted, and squished to conform to desired shapes. The 19th century saw an end to the hourglass figure for the tiny waist. So women, women were finally able to breathe more freely and move around more freely. So the question of our whole talk is, did the demise of tight facing help women gain the right to vote in 1920? We'd like you to think about that while you look at these next subject cartoons, which are not very funny, but no, not at all. Uh -huh. Some of these are, are slightly, I wouldn't say funny, but some of these are pretty bad, you'll see. Anybody any idea of the significance of 56 pounds? No, no we, we can't find it. We haven't found it out yet either. I'm still hunting, but I don't know why 56 pounds. Obviously, there's some reason for 56 pounds. I don't know. We haven't figured it out yet. Okay, sorry. See, they're not funny at all. So we've all heard about the force beating that suffragettes endured, but we didn't realize how bad it actually was. So we found some quotations from suffragettes themselves. Some of these are in the United States. Some of them are in the UK. Some of them are in Australia. To us, doesn't matter. They're all our foremothers. It doesn't matter what country they're coming from. But some of these are, these are pretty bad. So So the first one is Lady Constance Bulwer Lytton. You can't breathe, yet you choke. Every second seems an hour, and you think they'll never finish pushing the food down. Then the food is poured again, and again you choke, and your whole body resists. So her treatment caused a heart attack, and then later a stroke, and she died in 1923. And apparently while she was in jail, with a safety pin, she carved the letter V on her chest, which was the boat's woman symbol, so she was so serious about it. And in prison in Edinburgh, Scotland, Ethel Moore had developed pneumonia, double pneumonia when a foreign substance was in her lung after her eighth feeding. So it gets worse. Well, they are, 
Well, they, 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 they were because the women decided they would not eat, you know, it's like a, like a Gandhi kind of thing. But then they didn't want the, the jailer, didn't want them dying in prison. Right. So this is why they force fed them ostensibly. You know, we'll explain it in a second. But Actress Kitty Mary was forced fed 232 times, begging a doctor to give her poison to end her pain. And the worst one that we found, a woman named Janet Arthur, she was later identified as Fanny Parker. She was in a Perth prison in 1914. She was a victim of rectal and vaginal feeding. So her, these are her exact words. So Thursday morning, 16th July, the three wardresses appeared again. One of them said that they did not resist. She would send the others away and do what she had come to do as gently and as decently as possible. I consented. There was, this was another attempt to feed me by the rectum and was done in a cruel way, causing me great pain. She returned some time later and said she had something else to do. I took it to be another attempt to feed me in the same way but it proved to be a grosser and more indecent outrage, which would have been done for no other purpose than torture. It was followed by soreness, which lasted for several days. And apparently when Fanny was, re Fanny was released, there was a medical examination done, and she really did have genitals, genital swelling and genital infection. So the tubes used for these force feedings, very often they were dirty and they were used, which was the whole point of the whole thing, because women were supposed to feel dirty and indecent, which was the point of the whole reason why they did force feeding in the first place. Yes. I guess it was, but for women, yeah, they were they were getting away with it. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously, the force feeding in the stomach, okay, you could maybe see what they're doing, but you're not getting any nourishment benefit from rectal or vaginal feeding. So, yeah, and that that that's been kind of crept quiet in history. It's kind of hard to find some of this information. So especially after we learned this, our plea that you just use your vote, whoever you want, you want to vote for, of course it's up to you. But our former is fought so hard to win. It. So moving forward to the 1950s, so the housewife became the feminine ideal of the day. And I always tell Eris that you can't look at something through, that, through 2020 eyes. Like, for instance, we didn't live through that time, so we don't totally get it. But my mother talked about this, that for 20 years, people have been living with the Great Depression, they're followed by the World War II rationing, and they had just emerged from the st staggering losses of World War II. So we can't look at that through, that, through 2020 eyes. So when we were pushed back into the home, and the sexualized housewife roles, and their bodies were once again squished and squeezed. And I'm sure you all know that led to the second wave of feminism in the 1960s and 1970s. Which brings us to 2020, when all of this uh, underwear sort of thing is no longer called underwear, it's <coughs> called shapewear. And as Eris mentioned earlier, it's now a $684.9 million a year <laughs> annual industry. I'm sure you're all familiar with something called Spanx. Okay. Unfortunately, probably are. So these are a pair of spanks that we bought. We're holding the players in case you haven't seen them before. Yeah, that's the one good thing, and she owns her whole company. Yeah, she's on she's on Shark Tank a lot. The um, I was gonna say that's the one good thing about this. We did a kind of funny video where Eris actually Eris who doesn't have one excess ounce of flesh on her put the spanks on. How terrible! How horrible was that? Like I would say, obviously the corset's bad because it, it would be tighter in real life. But this is bad because it has it goes in that whole area, but then it includes your legs too. Put it back to me, take it off. I'm sure you know, I'm sure you've worn spanks at some point, but yeah. So a lot of women are kind of adopting a thanks, but no spanks attitude. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. Or... So kind of quote from a woman who has worn spanks quite a bit. She said, you know spanks are the worst, because the feeling you get when you finally peel them off is the best. It's like opening a can of Pillsbury's <laughs> biscuits. <laughs> After you peel back the paper, you can on the edge of the counter and gently until it pop, freedom. If it feels so good to get out of them, why are we subjecting ourselves to these torture chambers in the first place? It's a visual <coughs> So what's pretty shocking to us when we discover this, there's been some research done that the organ damage done by Victorian corsets, apparently the same damage is being done today to women who wear spanks on a regular basis. And I discovered this brand new thing, I guess it's a brand new thing, called Spanx arm tights. Are you familiar with these things? It's like these women now, so you're supposed to be mortified and embarrassed if you have any jiggly stuff over here. So, so I think what, what's most distressing to us is that in the past, men kind of did this to women, but today, women are doing it to themselves. And I bet we just find that kind of shocking and horrible. So people kind of roll their eyes over the beauty rituals of Betty Draper, you know, from Mad Men and Scarlett O'Hara. But meanwhile, we squeeze our bodies into skinny jeans, people flat iron their hair, people bleach, the women bleach their teeth, they pump your, pump your foreheads with botulism, people thread their eyebrows, and they wax their vaginas. Yeah, so 
should we really be teaching our girls to hold themselves in such unrealistic images? And the point of all of our first strand sanitized talks is that perhaps women need to be reminded of how far we've come to see how far we've come. And then I kind of a little lighter note. Have you all noticed somewhere in your life, have you all owned a bra that has a little bow there in the center? Yeah. And kind of wondered what that bow is about? But after the 15 and 1600s, women wore these things called stomachers, which is like a stay bus that they shoved down there. And the, but in order to keep the stay bus on, they would use that little ribbon there and kind of tie it there. So that little ribbon on bras is just a holdover from that stomacher. But I just kind of love history and how that, you know, all things came to be. And Eris is one of Eris' favorite quotes. Well, we gave women seldom make it. <laughs> and the whole point of this talk is that underwear matters. <laughs> so, oh. so, anybody have any questions, comments? Well, we spoke the other night. We had the whole big thing about how many women in the audience had worn girdles before. Have you, have you guys all? Yeah, so. Oh, Really? Oh, oh, you mean jig oh, so jiggling was bad. Yeah. Okay, jiggling is bad. I've still never seen one. I don't totally get For this talk, we want to get we want to get like an old 1950s girdle, because Eris hasn't seen what it really I remember my mother wearing them. Yeah, because some my mother used to wear a rubber one. I remember that. Yeah, right, Humber stockings, yeah. I had a first child, Lonnie, when I went to the doctor Prescribed. <laughs> I was little and I didn't know. Yeah, prescribed for. I don't know why. Wow. They told me why you're supposed to. What is it supposed to have? Hold everything in. Yeah, a male doctor. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So he, he was really angry with me. Wow. He gets a yeah, he gets a. Yeah, yeah he gets that guy blessed. Right, exactly. <laughs> Very good. That's true. Huh? We talked to a woman who just the other night, she was. She looked, I couldn't believe that she said this. She, was, uh, she said she remembers in the 1950s going to her prom and wearing her girdle under her prom dress, which meant she had to be like in her 80s. This woman looked amazing. I, I feel like she was. And hoops for sure. Hoops for too. Yeah, so. Yeah. 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 Did you know what it was? Oh, that one I did that? Oh, okay. 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 All right. Okay. Yes. Just the comment. Yeah. I saw it just last week. Of course, it's far back. Yeah. And there's certain people that are wearing them now. I know, yeah. They want them because they look turner mm -hmm. in their tight mm -hmm. jeans. Yeah. And I think they call them waist. Do they call them cinchers now, I think? Like, they they kind of showed it to me. It looks just like the old fashioned Yeah. Yes, yeah. Like the one you have on there, so that's not mm -hmm. terrible, right? Like, well, it's not really tight. They'd be able to talk and not uh, something. Right, yeah, 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 right, exactly, yes, yes. I've heard that it was partly the invention of bicycles that was really emancipating for yeah. women in their clothing and their underwear, that all of a sudden women could travel without a chaperone. Um, Th and that's kind of, it kind of all came at the same time, like women doing the men's work in World War One. yeah, I read the bike also, kind of all of it just kind of happened at, kind of at the same time, and that's kind of where we were going with the talk, like, it wasn't, it wasn't really just one thing, just as it is in, in anybody's life or in history at all. It wasn't just the one thing that did it. But yes, I read that also. Yes. Yes. When did women start wearing underpants? Because I understand for many, many, until maybe the 18th, 19th century, they did not, they did not wear underpants. They wore, they wore nothing, and then they wore the crotchless underwear, and then regular under, underwear with... Um, when did the crotchless stop? That would have been the first... Underwear. Crotchless underwear didn't start, stop until about 1900. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the stuff like we wear today around. I would say they're wearing it in the in colonial era, so it must have been around 1700s. Yes. Yep. Or before that, 1607, right around there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Yes. Oh, get get a little get a little for show. Yeah, I guess so. Yes, yes. Celebrities now they watch the Grammy Awards, the award shows. Mm -hmm. They wear like and you see almost everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 
No one's going to stop and shop that way at least. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I don't know if they ever wore all those bones whenever you have a little wire over here that's I know, yeah, when you were, yeah, I know, and that's 60, 60 to 100 in a corset, yeah. Yeah, what do they call those things? The underwear, yeah, the yeah, underwear, yeah, those are horrible. So, yes, yes, absolutely, yes, yes. Any other questions? Otherwise, thank you so much for coming. Aren't you glad you're alive today? 